Do what? Do it. Yeah, I saw the little make... red light. I, I saw, saw the little red, red light. light. Yeah. Oh, you to give me. dang. I got to give me intelligence. I didn't catch oh. you this time. Nope. What is up, everybody? Nope. This is Stu, and that's David, and that's Mark, and this is Filling the Storehouse podcast, episode something, uh, 30. We're almost at 30, dude. I think this might be 30, but I, really, real quick. So, if anybody's watching this on YouTube, so I see Stu, me, and Mark. So when you point like that, you're assuming that everybody's seen the same thing. And oh. now you look like a complete jackal. Sorry, everybody. Don't watch it on YouTube. Just listen to it. Just listen to it. Yep. My name's Mark in case anybody's confused. Hey, that's Mark. See, who am I pointing at right now? Mark. St- oh. Mark. <laughs> Mark, what's up, man? Uh, who, who is this Mark guy? Uh, Dude, why are you on this podcast? Time. Why are you well, on this podcast? Uh, because I give out t-shirts. Stu is a good example. or, Stu or... I, I actually don't have a t-shirt, uh, Mark. So wh- where did you give cool. these out? You're, You're breaking up. I can't hear you. So uh, Mark Solomon, I uh, five years ago started a uh, charity with some combat veterans called Veterans Community Project. And we're housing homeless veterans in tiny houses. Uh, the gist of it is that uh, there's too many opportunities for um uh, veterans to get told no when they come back and they need help or even if they didn't come back or they served for five minutes or 35 years it doesn't matter um there's lots of no's in the way of hey i need help whatever that help might be so our attitude was at the time um a couple of the the vets that uh, started this with me my buddies they worked with uh, veterans some homeless some just in crisis and literally a lot of the programs were designed around saying no not because the people that worked in those programs were bad it was just where the money comes from so federal funds it's tuesday and it's sunny out and sorry those funds aren't available till wednesday when it's partly cloudy right and so uh the answer was constantly no and my buddies just got tired of saying no to, to people who had served and so they decided they wanted to do something different wrote some ideas down literally on a napkin may have been at a bar and uh here we are five years later we're actually a nationwide uh charity expanding the multiple cities we just uh did a groundbreaking in longmont colorado for our second uh, vcp village of tiny houses for homeless veterans and that's where we gave out t-shirts so david you missed it sorry you weren't there we'll do another one coming up soon i can't say where yet it's gonna happen sucks you're not in colorado dude <laughs> that's the cool place to be hey dude uh you don't have to tell me I know. Hey, Mark, that's, that's awesome. And, and obviously, so can you tell me a little bit about your, just your military background as well and, and give us context to kind of, you know, what your service looked like, what you're doing now and, and, and uh, just, you know, help, help our guests understand that you're doing all this. This is obviously, uh, you know, the veterans community is not your only gig, right? You've got a lot going on right now. Yeah, so uh, 2004, I got into the Navy uh, in the direct commission officer program. I didn't go to the academy. I didn't play football or anything like that. Um, And so, uh, yeah, 2004, got in direct commission officer, no prior service into the reserves uh, in intelligence. And so I've been in 16 years. And um, during that time, I was selling real estate full time, started this charity as well. Uh, I'm actually getting ready to deploy again. Uh, and so my comments do not reflect those of the Department of Defense or the United States Navy and are solely my own. Good coverage there, dude. Nice. That is. We probably should start doing that, Stu, seeing as uh, our respective positions currently. But anyhow. I speak for all of us when I say that. Thank, thank you very much for that. And that covers all previous episodes. Uh, so we're good. Henceforth and to wit as well. So. <laughs> Um, so basically, uh, that was kind of, you know, my thing is just, uh, got in, uh, I'd always wanted to serve. I actually, and don't hold this against me. I took the air force officer qualifying test, uh, as I was uh, getting into my senior year of uh, college at Iowa state and, uh, decided at that point, this was the late nineties and it was either get a tech job making big fatty dollars and, you know, retiring after a year or two, uh, with stock options or going into the Air Force. That was an easy choice, right? So I uh, skipped the Air Force and went into the tech job. Stock was like 60 bucks a share for this tech company I went into. It was awesome. Uh, Two years later, there may have been a bubble that burst. Not my fault. And stock was like $2 a a share. And so that uh, sort of ruined my retirement plans. But I had always wanted to serve. I remember uh, 
high school, I think it was, just taking a family trip. We grew up poor in my family, so this was an amazing thing. And in high school, we got to go to Hawaii uh, on a uh, family vacation. And I remember visiting Pearl Harbor and uh, the Arizona Memorial and thinking, you know, someday I, I'd like to come back here and pay my respects in uniform. Uh, and so that was my earliest memory of sort of wanting to join the Navy and the, uh, got into the civilian world after college and uh, eventually thought, you know what, I still want to do this. Found the direct commission officer program in the Navy and uh, took three years to apply, so or to get in, basically. So uh, the first two years, the Navy decided they didn't want me because clearly there was something wrong with the Navy. Uh, they came around and decided in 2004 that uh, after I finished my master's that it was probably worthwhile or this guy was going to keep coming back. I think that was their choice was keep seeing his application or let him in. And uh, so that's where that started. Did that, a um, bunch of different civilian careers, worked at a defense contracting company before I got into real estate full-time. 2013, started selling real estate uh, full-time. And truthfully, just for uh, folks that are, are interested in all of that, I had like the worst start to a real estate career ever. I drained two 401ks in 2013, 2014. Uh, didn't really sell much uh, at the end of 2014. My wife gave me that look that only a spouse can uh, give her husband, and she said, you either start selling something or get a real job, and I decided that I wanted to stay married, so uh, I decided to actually start working. So I went from 2000, end of 2014, basically almost getting out of the business, to in 2015, by May, I had made six figures in gross commission income, hired my first administrative assistant, started a team, uh, and then... Every year since, I've uh, basically doubled my business. And uh, in June, uh, just prior to my deployment, I, uh, my team was in the top 2% of all uh, Kansas City regional uh, realtors. So we're, uh, there's 12,000 licensed agents in the Kansas City metro area, and we were in the top 2%. So uh, that went well. And in the meantime, like I said, started uh, with some other guys, started this charity. And um, that's kind of my big thing is always, it's always about paying it forward. So I sell real estate so that I can sort of change the world is the idea, right? So I love helping people uh, get in or out of a house. That's uh, fun for me. I, I try and have fun with it, joke around with my clients, educate them through the process so that it's not uh, a surprise. I don't like surprises in a real estate transaction. And I uh, also want to take any success I have and uh, make sure that that gets paid forward. And so this charity was just a, a great way to, to make sure we do that. So we volunteer a lot on my team and this is just one of the, one of the ways that we're able to pay it forward. So my success is uh, clearly through uh, and with the help of others and, and I'm gonna make sure that uh, we carry that forward. That's, so you started in Kansas City as, as a realtor and then, um, and then you kind of just voila, got this veteran community project up and running. Um, you know, I remember you telling me that, that it kind of just started on, on a napkin and, and now here you are, uh, one com community village, like completely up and running, incredibly successful. You're starting to you just uh, broke ground on another one here in Colorado with plans for lots right. more. Right. So, um, if you could kind of, you know, kind of step back and like, how, how did you go from a, uh, an idea on a napkin uh, with some buddies to getting this, you know, full blown, you know, nonprofit organization up and running to where it is. So now. in fairness to me and my buddies, um, I'm an officer and I just have the ideas and they go execute. So it was easy. I just said, go make stuff happen. And they did. It, so, uh, so have really good people around. That's, that's the important part, right? Talent, uh, surround yourself that's with talent. Awesome. So um, the reality is we all brought something to the table. It was a, an idea of, hey, we want to go do something. Uh, a couple of my buddies worked in uh, in veteran service organizations, um, and so they were feeling the pain every day. I did real estate, so I brought my business savvy to the to the table and my connections. As a realtor, I knew everybody who could do whatever it was we needed, and sort of those things sort of worked together. Um, and yeah, originally it was, how do we help vets, and how do we say yes to people who are willing to give up their life for their country, um, whether, like I said, for us, uh, we don't take any federal funds. So for us, it is anybody who ever served regardless of their discharge status. All they have to be able to do is come in and say, I need a fill in the blank, and then we go to work. 
And so we wanted to start an organization that was like that. How does that work? What does that look like? It was fundraising initially. We were working out of a buddy's kitchen, you know, for a long time, that sort of thing, kicking in our own dollars, mortgaging houses, all that kind of stuff. And then eventually it started taking off. People got behind what we were doing. Um, the tiny house idea uh, obviously is, is uh, a thing. And the idea really is just transitional housing for homeless veterans. And we also, so that, so that's a small part of what we do, truthfully. I, I joke it's the tiniest part of what we do is with our tiny houses. It's that transitional housing. That was a joke. You guys didn't laugh. Uh, thank you. And so um, for those of you on, uh, not on YouTube, they were laughing. For real you couldn't hear it but i was on mute i was on mute so that if kids come in and scream or dogs bark you don't hear it so i was laughing, laughing. My, i was laughing my brains out yeah. i actually had to keep it yeah, muted because i was laughing so hard i didn't want to interrupt you so. i appreciate that so uh you know the tiny houses being the tiny part of what we do and then we have an outreach center where veterans can just walk in and say again i need uh whatever and then we can get to work so that's why we don't take federal funds is we just wanted that flexibility to be able to say yes to vets in whatever way they need and react quickly. So my buddies, some of them would do street outreach. They'd go under a bridge and they might see a veteran. And you know, this person may have lived out there for years uh, under that bridge and they may have the right tattoos. They're saying the right things. They don't remember their social. They may have some other issues going on. Um, and what they would have to do at that point is say, hey, I believe you're a vet. I know I can get you some help. You stay under this bridge. And in six months, when I get all the paperwork sorted out, I'll come back and get you. And if you're still here and you still want help, then I can help right? And that's just the way of the system and understand it. It doesn't mean that we have to tolerate it, right? So uh, that's where we came in and said, hey, we're just going to do that. So if we see a vet under a bridge and we want to help them, we just get to work. Whether it turns out they're not a vet, we don't run into that very often, but if that happens, great, we can still help people. Uh, really, our charter is on, on um, veterans, and so we focus on those folks. So if we come across a veteran that has a dishonorable discharge, isn't eligible for services, that doesn't mean we can't help them. So we can write a check and get them housed real quick if it's an apartment or a, sorry, a hotel for the weekend or whatever it is, and then get them into whatever comes next, a rehab program, uh, money management classes, whatever they need. Uh, again, we can just get to work. Uh, sometimes it's simple, sometimes it is money management um, that's keeping people homeless. Sometimes they're uh, we'd actually, we do uh, what we call, we have diversionary funds that uh, we help people stay in their homes, right? So we don't want homeless veterans. So we're trying to avoid that. So, hey, I'm going to lose my place if I don't have $200 in back rent. Great. Okay, let's figure out one, what got you there. And so we don't get there again. And two, here's $200, go pay your rent or we'll pay your rent for you so that uh, you don't get kicked out. So again, it's just very flexible. We started in Kansas City um, with five acres of land. Uh, and basically in 2018, we uh, opened our uh, outreach center. So we started helping veterans. Um, I think I have the timeline right. Uh, maybe 2017, sorry. 2018, I think, is when we opened our first 13 houses uh, and started servicing vets there in houses. Uh, and then now we've expanded and finished our village in Kansas City. So it's 49 tiny houses in Kansas City. Uh, it is a, also includes a 5,000 square foot community center with like a teaching kitchen. Uh, a veterinary uh, area for our veterans can bring their pets so they get help if they need that uh, and just basically taking care of vets in whatever way they need at our village and then our outreach center and we're going to mirror the same thing in uh, in Longmont Colorado north of uh, Denver with uh, 26 tiny houses a 3,000 square foot community center and also an outreach center uh, and then backing up just briefly and, and uh, I appreciate that I'm taking up the entire podcast um, but basically, uh, in Kansas City, when we started, we got the land, this five acres of land to put these houses on from the city for $500. Uh, so that was great. But there was no infrastructure, so no sewer, water, electric. And our houses are permanent structures. So that makes us different than other uh, organizations that are housing veterans or homeless folks in tiny houses is that our uh, houses meet all local building codes for new construction. So they're built on site. Uh, right now we're doing slab on grade and so uh, no basements, but they are built to new construction building codes and city wherever. So we started in Kansas City, like I said, 500 bucks for five acres. The city helped us put in infrastructure and what an amazing town Kansas City is, by the way. They've just been super supportive uh, from the city itself to just different organizations, individuals in town, donating time, effort, money. And so, we uh, retail on that land, by the way, as a, as a real estate agent, I'm always looking at this stuff. Retail on that land would have been right around 40 grand when we bought it. Um, we recently had it appraised at $1.5 million. 
So we moved homeless people to an area of land and actually increased its value. So that's one thing that's really cool about what we did that's kind of a side effect. It's, it's been awesome. The second piece uh, of what we've realized is that we've also, we we're working on an economic impact study to put some data to this, is that we've increased the property values of the surrounding properties as well. Uh, so again, we moved homeless people to an area of town and increased the local values, uh, which hopefully if we continue to do this, will turn the uh, nimbyism, the not in my backyard uh, mentality around homelessness on its head, right? So, hey, we want homeless folks in our, in our backyard because it's going to raise our values is kind of the idea now that we've seen it work. So in Colorado, a developer uh, was basically working on uh, a project in Longmont, so again, a town north of, of uh, Denver. And the city had decided, of Longmont had said, you know, we want to end veteran homelessness in our area. And how do we do that? They formed a commission. This developer happened to be on that. They looked at partnering with other organizations, uh, came to Kansas City to visit us as their last stop. And honestly, the developer came and was, wanted to see what was going on. And we kind of pulled him off, truthfully, because we were busy helping veterans, right? So uh, he went around, looked at our village, and he said he had his aha moment, which was, I would live next to one of these houses, tiny houses. And so uh, he went back to Longmont, told the committee that he was on that, hey, I think this is the right thing to do. They kind of twisted his arm a little bit, truthfully, and said, well, we know where the village is going to be. It's going to be on one of your new developments. And he kind of thought, you know, do I really want homeless people next to one of my high-end developments? And he realized the answer was yes. And so I, an amazing human, uh, the company is HMS Development. Uh, the gentleman I'm talking about is Kevin Malshine. And Kevin, um, like I said, he's one of our biggest advocates. Uh, and he basically realizes that he builds world-class subdivisions, uh, you know, with houses and townhouses and condos and things like that. He just realized that, you know, um, not only should you have great amenities like pools and tennis courts and all that, but uh, compassion should also be an amenity. And so he's putting his money where his mouth is. So he's donating uh, two acres of land for us next to a brand new subdivision for us to build these 26 tiny houses and a 3,000 square foot community center for homeless veterans. His subdivision will be about 450 total housing units that'll include uh, condos, townhouses and single family homes, anywhere from kind of the mid to upper twos is what they're trying uh, to, uh, for the condos, all the way to $900,000 for the single family homes with views of the mountains 20 minutes away. And on purpose, as part of the subdivision, you're gonna have homeless veterans living as part of it. So it's the only place in the country I know that uh, is gonna have that going on. Um, and so they he basically took an idea we had in Kansas City and I like to joke, he said, hold my beer and they've one upped it. And, I'm super excited about where this has gone and uh, basically what's next in the country. I have no idea, but we, we're, our plan is to be in uh, eight total cities by 2022. And uh, we've got some, uh, again, in the next probably month or two, we're going to have some more announcements of different cities that we're, we're going to be groundbreaking in and, and launching. So an idea on a napkin turned into, you know, this, a nationwide charity that's helping end veteran homelessness. And uh, Stu is at the groundbreaking. And one of the stats is that, on any given night in the United States, there's about 40,000 veterans that are sleeping on the streets. And I tell people all the time, like these are people who took the same oath we did, right? They were willing to defend the constitution uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, up to and including with their lives. And regardless of the circumstances or outcome of their service, they're sleeping on the streets. At one point they were willing to give up their life for the country and they're sleeping on the streets, 40,000 of them every single night. And so uh, while that number is inexcusable, uh, we have absolutely determined it's not insurmountable and we're gonna go do something about it. Now I'll breathe yeah. for a second and you guys jump in. Colorado too. That's Cheers. all, <laughs> yeah, this is the, uh, no. I have, lots of uh, I have a ton of questions too. So Stu, I'm gonna, I wish I could mute you. No, I'm just kidding. That, that was awesome, Mark. Uh, you know, there's, there's so much, I mean, there's so much depth that we could literally be on this podcast for four or five hours. Cause I, I have a ton of questions and I'm not gonna, I, I know I'm not gonna be able to address them all, but, but a, two of them that are just kind of kept resonating with me. So when you're looking at the holistic approach to um, basically to healing, right. To, to solving these issues, you mentioned, the training aspect and the different um, services. Are, are you partnering with folks for those services or are you actually establishing your own uh, pipeline of, you know, whatever requirements are, are needed? 
Yeah, great question. So we, uh, we partner as much as possible. Our goal is never to reinvent uh, programs that already exist. And as I mentioned earlier, just because these programs are tied, some of them to federal dollars, doesn't mean they're not great programs. It just means that sometimes there's hoops. And if you're homeless or you've got issues, sometimes it's hard to navigate those. Come to us, we'll help you figure out how to navigate those, and then we'll get you into the right program, civilian or uh, you know VA type program, whatever it happens to be. So yes, our goal is absolutely um, not reinvent, but to partner with other organizations that already exist, um, whether they're organizations that help with whatever it is or individuals for that matter. So I always tell people it's, you know, it's in the name Veterans Community Project. We serve veterans. It's an ongoing project. Community is in the middle and it's not by accident, by the way, that we did that. The community is what really makes this work. Um, so we connect veterans and the community and the community with the veterans. So if you're just a person who's like, you know what, I uh, am great at writing resumes and I've had a lot of people I've helped, you know, get jobs. Um, you're not likely to call up the VA and say, hey, I'd like to help veterans write you know, their, their resumes. With us, you can do that and we can put you in touch with either organizations that already do that or us directly or whatever it happens to be, but we can certainly put you right in touch with a veteran directly who might need your assistance. So it allows us to sort of, again, cut through a lot of the red tape that exists with these different programs and just start with us. We'll help you figure out sort of navigating the, the next steps. Yeah. That that's great. And, and Stu, if you don't mind, I have just one other question that'll probably lead into your question, but I'm dying to ask this. So, so I, I uh, recently finished a book, um, social, social capitalist by uh, folks that, that, that we work with quite a bit, you know, the warrior's heart, uh, the warrior's heart team. And um, one of the things that, that stuck out to me is, is they said a lot of the businesses that, that do stuff like this fail because what, what people, the problem with what people do is they, they come into it with an idea and the compassion piece of it and think that that can be a successful business because of the compassion. And that's just not the way it really is. It works in the world. What really works is a very sound business plan that supports the compassion and, and, and your why. And those two have to mirror and they have to go together to make something, um, to make something great, like what you guys are establishing. So I, I'm curious, this is, so are you guys a nonprofit or are you a for-profit that's doing no, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Absolutely. Right. Yet, I will tell you that um, the current CEO is an attorney. We don't hold that against him. It's not a really good one. Uh, <laughs> but Brian Meyer is his name. Uh, Marine as well, by the way. So that'll tell you a lot there. Uh, yet, well, and, and myself, we were really from a business background. So the other guys that we started with had more of a social service background. And I've done nonprofit work before and all that. Um, but that business background, we really run it like a business that is a nonprofit, right? We, there are certain rules, IRS and all that stuff. We, we absolutely follow all those things. Uh, but from the beginning, for example, I, uh, one of my buddies uh, helps nonprofits uh, with their books. So from the very beginning, uh, we've been paying this guy to manage our books for us so that we weren't doing it ourselves running like a business as opposed to, oh, let me do this on the side while I'm trying to figure out, you know, hey, we got a fundraise and where do we do this and get our IRS filing. We got people. So we started, you know, sort of running it, like I said, like a, a real business. Um, that's a lot of, I think, what makes us different as well as we partner with a lot of organizations and I want them to succeed just as much as we do, whether it's a private for-profit organization. Um, I don't mind that, you know, some of our big sponsors have come out and done photo ops where they're helping build houses and all that, that's great because I want people to know that their employees and their organization supports people like us that are nonprofits, right? I want them to benefit from that as well because the more they benefit, the better off we are when they donate dollars back. So absolutely, it's, uh, it's nonprofit, yet we, we run it like a business. We had a business plan to begin with. Uh, the founders uh, and the people who now run the organization, we've got great talent. We meet annually to sort of do our, our planning as we go forward. What's our one year, five year, that kind of plan. So all of those things that uh, unfortunately, I think, like you said, there's some really, really neat organizations out there that are doing amazing work. I mean, they're just, they're literally doing God's work out there and they can't get that momentum that they need to get off the ground. Um, because they're just, they're doing it a little differently. Like you said, it's compassion first. Unfortunately, just the way things are is you got to run a business and to be compassionate. And, and, and in my for-profit real estate business, that's exactly what we do. All, all I know, and I, I tell people all the time, my people invented karma, right? So we got to treat people right. Um, and so basically 
doing all the right things in your business to run a successful business and, and delegate authority and do all those things and treat people correctly will create income that then can go to paying it forward. The same is true with our, our nonprofit is we're going to do all the right things by our veterans. Uh, and as the community starts to hear about that, it, it kind of builds uh, some momentum and then people get involved and, and we've had great success. We've been truly blessed, I will tell you, with all of the different support we've had and people uh, who are awesome wearing our shirts running around town, the ones wearing our shirts, not the ones who don't have them. Uh, I mean, they're okay too. We like those people too. Uh, you can go to our website at veteranscommunityproject.org and buy a shirt, by the way. Just if you want. I will do uh, that. I will do that. Buy a shirt. Yeah. I will. Anyway, so that, yeah, long, long answer to a short question, but that basically uh, it is uh, run like a business. Absolutely. And it's okay to do that. I think that's uh, important. Right? I, rules, right? Yeah, I think that's important. And really the, the, the intent behind the question was to highlight the fact that as folks are doing this stuff and as our veteran, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our listeners are just these entrepreneurs that are just hard chargers and, uh, but having that sound business plan and executing it in a very real thing that's not just a side gig or whatever I think is, is, is paramount. And, and let me clarify a little bit. We started as a side gig, right? I mean, all of the, the people who started this, we couldn't just jump in right away and we didn't have all the dollars to just throw at it. You know, like I said, mortgage houses and all that to make it happen. We had a, we had an understanding that we needed to get something done. Right. And that maybe is a, is more of a military mindset. I don't know. That's entirely true. Uh, I know some people who've never served in the military who have a great, let's go get it mindset. Um, the difference between us and our, our not, you know, this nonprofit veterans community project and others who've had the idea of housing veterans in tiny houses or whatever it is, the reason we are expanding like we are is because we just basically decided we were going to go do it and then acted on it. And so to your listeners too, it's the same thing, whether you're investing in real estate or you're doing whatever it is, or, you know, my real estate team that I have, it's really about just, you got to go execute. You can have all the ideas rolling around in here and I got a million of them. Um, it's just when you go execute, that's when you start to see those results and things start to happen. Um, and it's, you also have to realize that it's not just you. I, I can't do any of this stuff without all of the amazing people around us, right? My, my real estate sales agents on my team, uh, from that business standpoint to even the charity, we've attracted some of the best talent in the world. I'm super excited to be in business with these people in this nonprofit. Um, and that's what makes it go. As I am deploying, I will be gone for a year. I may not be able to communicate with folks in the, the nonprofit. And I will tell you what, Veterans Community Project uh, is going to grow in spite of me, which I think is awesome, right? That's the best place for them to be is that they don't need me. Uh, I had the bright idea. You got great people that are going to go execute. You just got to let people uh, find those people who are super talented and motivated and let them go do their thing. And I will also tell you, it's not without failure, right? I mean, uh, every organization has failures, whether again, it's real estate or, or even our nonprofit. We've had moments where we didn't think this was going to work. There's, there was there was five million steps between five years ago and a napkin and where we are today, right? Uh, I've mentioned before that everybody gets to that sort of mountaintop and you look up and you go, hey, look, I'm at the mountaintop. What they don't mention is you look up and over and then you see there's another mountain. And then you got to go climb that one too, right? Um, but the people down at this one are looking up going like, man, I wish I could be at that mountaintop. But then you're looking at the next one going, man, I got to get to that one too. So there's always that next mountaintop. And so you just, you know that sometimes you're going to fall. It's going to be a gazillion steps. Uh, people around you are going to fall. Some of them aren't going to be the right people. There's going to be the right people, whatever it happens to be. You just have to be open, flexible, but don't give up on that. Hey, I just have to execute. I got to get to the top of this mountain. I don't know what comes after that. Just got to get to the top of this mountain, and we'll we'll address the the next steps from there. Yeah, and I was gonna I was gonna say it's it's just been like super easy, right? Like you know no no you know no failures, no no challenges, no nothing. With Solomon at the helm, absolutely. It's been, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, so I'm I'm incredibly interested in just this this idea of a nonprofit organization partnering so to speak really with a for-profit large real estate developer and this developer taking two acres of land in Longmont Colorado basically giving it to you and titling it deeding it to you um, with the idea that it is going to impact his business in a positive way um, that I mean it's it's really it's kind of outside the box thinking a little bit but and, and, and he, he talked about it at uh, the groundbreaking ceremony, how 
it's the first time it's ever been done, right? Yeah. And, um, and then you talked about how uh, the value of the real estate around the, you know, the property in Kansas City has, has blown up. And I'm assuming, you know, we're going to expect the, the exact same thing in Longmont. Why, why do you think that is? Like what, what's kind of this aha moment that um, HMS developers had um, that kind of is bringing us all together and um, where does it go from here? Sure. Um, so one of the things I think is, is just, again, being create, create, creative, sorry. Um, so when you think about it, especially people who have these ideas, again, whether it's your, your own personal business or whether it's, you know, this nonprofit or whatever it is you want to do, you have these ideas of where you want to go. The problem is when you put the blinders on and you miss other opportunities, right? So again, running like a business, we've decided we're going to be flexible about this. What does this look like? And so when they came to us from Longmont and said, hey, this is what we have going on here. We'd like to work with you on this. We started figuring out, okay, what can we do? Um, because Normally, we might be like, no, we don't really want to do this. This is how we do it. This is how we did it in Kansas City. That's the only way to do it. Instead, we were like, yeah, let's figure something out. So we worked with the city of Longmont. They've been spectacular. The developer, uh, a ton of folks have sort of jumped in and said, okay, how do we be flexible? Again, particularly the city with their their rules. They have them and they should. Um, how do we make this work? And so the developer is donating the, the land. He's also, by the way, because again, he's a great human, is donating to uh, habitat for humanity. They get an acre of land as well, and they get eight habitat houses that they're going to build. So we're going to have uh, permanent housing, uh, affordable type housing for habitat homes right there on the property, our village of transitional homes for homeless veterans, and then high-end subdivisions, right? Um, so he's donating the two acres of land to us, uh, along with all the sewer, water, and electric infrastructure. It represents about a three, three and a half million dollar donation that he's making to That's us. That's crazy, so, man. So That's now awesome. the benefit though, what's where he gets something out of it. And this again, what we want, we're going to partner with people who I want them to get something out of this too, right? It doesn't have yeah. to be altruistic. We all can win at this. And so what he gets it for those of you in corporate America, it's win-win we call it, right? So um, he basically, he gets to, uh, there's an affordable housing requirement in the city of Longmont. So when he builds a new subdivision, he's got to sell a certain number of houses, basically at a discount to make them affordable. The developer, the development company is actually working with their builders. They're working on what they call workforce housing. They're trying to make some of these condos affordable anyway for people who live and work in Longmont, teachers and firefighters to be able to live there. Um, so they're working on that anyway, and they would be doing that in spite of what we're doing. What they get to do, though, is that they get to sell more of their houses at full retail price because they're doing this donation. So the city said, hey, because you're willing to do this for homeless veterans and help us solve that problem, uh, we're going to allow you to sell more of your houses at just full retail, so you don't have to discount them. Now, again, because they're good people, they're already working on how they can keep the houses pr uh, priced uh, affordably anyway. But now they get to sell more houses at a higher price, so they're winning there, right? So they get to make more money. The second piece is the city has agreed to expedite our, our process. So this would normally take about four years to get to the groundbreaking point where we're at. COVID has interrupted a little bit, but um, we're about two years into wow. what would normally be a four-year process for them to start breaking ground and building houses. So, um, so they would be about maybe, let's say, year five from start to finish. Again, all things being equal with COVID adding some time there. Uh, they're going to be about two and a half to three years into this when they can start having houses built that they can sell full retail, keep on going. So they get to make money faster and they get to make more money by making sure that they solve another issue that's going on in the community, and these are people who live locally, the developer, um, is, is homelessness, right? So they're working on with us uh, on the homeless veteran issue, and uh, they get to benefit as well. So it, again, it's like we said, in corporate America speak, it's win-win, and, and that's the point is that everybody gets something out of this. The city gets to solve their problems. We get land, and we get to run an organization in, in Colorado. By the way, we're going to be raising and spending about a million dollars a year in services we're going to be providing to our veterans in just this small village, right? That doesn't necessarily include some of the ancillary services we'll do for walk-ins. Um, but so we're adding to the, to the economy in Longmont. Uh, the builder gets to build houses, employ people, all that kind of stuff as they're doing the building and, and sell houses to people. Those people who buy houses, by the way, will have volunteer opportunities to come and pay it forward with us, helping us build our tiny houses for our homeless veterans while they watch their house get built. Um, so there's just, it's this big, uh, you know, holistic sort of approach to 
to how to make the community work together to solve a problem. And it isn't, we, we, you know, affordable housing, let's just do it on the other side of town away from me. Instead, it's, hey, it's actually going to be in my backyard. And I love the fact that I can just walk over here and help somebody with a resume or help them grocery shop or help them cook. Uh, or, you know, help them with their dog, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's just, like I said, it's a, it's an all encompassing approach to getting the community involved and, and making it work. It's not just us doing it. It's not just the developer. It's not just the city. It's everybody working together. I love that. Now, are, are you, uh, is, is um, veteran homelessness a big issue in Longmont or is it, is it servicing like the bigger problem you, you you're reaching down into Denver and I just didn't know that it was yeah. such a significant issue in you know in that part of Colorado is it is it specific to Longmont is that why you um, so Longmont the reason Longmont is a thing honestly is because there's a developer who's willing to give us three million dollars worth of stuff right so truthfully that's it again we're, we're a nonprofit um, and we're going to be flexible so normally if I was going to put uh, you know a list of criteria of all the places I was going to go Longmont by itself wouldn't be the place. There's probably in the northern Colorado, uh, particularly the Boulder County area, we, Boulder County particularly, um, is where it's at. We assess probably around 100 veterans are sleeping on the streets every night. I don't have the numbers for Denver. I promise it's way higher. Okay. Yeah, there are no a doubt. lot of services in Denver. Uh, there are some, again, great organizations that are doing that. Um, what we found in Colorado, one, we're the, I believe, the only veteran specific organization in what they call Northern Colorado. So Boulder County kind of North uh, all the way up to Wyoming. We're the only veteran specific organization. So we're gonna be able to supplement a lot of these other organizations that are seeing homeless people. Some of them veterans come into their doors. Now they can send them directly to us and we can just get to work on, on helping them from a veteran standpoint. Um, so that's one. And then uh, two in, in Denver, they, like I said, they have a lot of support. What we found though is the model is a little different in Colorado versus what we're doing in Kansas City. So one of the big things is transportation. So as a vet, if I wanted, and living in Longmont, so north of Denver, if I wanted to go to the VA, I can choose Cheyenne, Wyoming, if I wanna go up there. It is about an hour and 15 minutes to get there if I drive just straight up. Uh, if I wanna go to the VA in Aurora, which is just east of Denver, uh, that's a big VA. It's a huge brand new facility. It's awesome. Uh, it could, if I was going to take the, the city buses, it could take me about four hours to get there. I could go to an entirely different state and uh, be there a lot faster. So what we found in, in the northern part of Colorado particularly is transportation is an issue. So we're working with different uh, folks to figure out how do we help as an organization. It's not our thing. We don't have tran the same transportation issues in Kansas City. Um, how do we help solve potentially the transportation issues that are keeping vets from getting services in the Northern Colorado area? So that's one area we're working on. The second thing is housing. Uh, Kansas City has very affordable housing, although it's creeping up and it's getting harder and harder for, for people to afford it. It's not anywhere near like it is in, in Colorado in the Denver uh, metro area. Uh, and so what we've found is that while there are vouchers available for government programs, HUD bash, things like that, great programs and they really do work. Landlords are reluctant to take those and to house people because what if one of these people punches a hole in the wall? What if they do something silly, right? Who's going to take care of making my place marketable again so I can get, you know, better rates and rent and all that kind of stuff. So again, we're working on, do we have an opportunity to bridge that gap? Maybe we can provide some assistance to those landlords if they're willing to put veterans in their properties. We will provide that gap that says, hey, if something happens, we'll help you fix it. And the other thing is that we provide case management support. And that's probably one of the biggest things that helps us be successful is our case managers that we provide are on an eight to one ratio with our veterans. Uh, so for every one case manager, we have about eight veterans that we're helping. Most social services organizations are on about a 30 or 40 to one ratio with the people that they're serving. And so it's overwhelming. And again, it's not because these people aren't great, they're awesome, but they're just overwhelmed by the number of cases they have. We have high levels of accountability and we hold our veterans to a certain standard that they create when we put a program in place for them. So, uh, you know, if Stu decides that he wants to come into our program because he's got issues, and he does, maybe not the ones that make him homeless, but he's got issues, but he wants right. to come and join us, we're gonna craft a program for Stu that's specific to him and then we're gonna hold him accountable to his goals and make sure that he meets those with our case managers. Um, and so we do that as well with 
again, what we're looking at in Colorado and changing our model a little bit, being flexible is my point uh, with whatever idea you have, is maybe in Colorado what we're going to do is, uh, as we staff up our case management staff, is maybe we take our veterans and our landlords and we put them together and say, hey, there's great organizations in Denver that have these vouchers. They just don't have places for vets. So you take the vet. We will provide the case management to make sure that vet is good and they get the help they need. And if there's issues with them punching holes in walls, we'll help fix that. Now will you take that veteran and house them? Now all of a sudden, these vouchers that these other organizations have can be used and now we're housing vets, even if it's not specifically all on us in our tiny houses. So again, just thinking sort of, uh, creatively on, on how we can solve problems. And that's gonna be very different in the other communities we're going to, right? Uh, so while while our charter remains the same, is, is we're gonna help uh, solve the veteran homeless problem in the country, we're just gonna be really flexible about how we're willing to do that and what does that look like? This is high-end subdivision, tiny houses and outreach and working with landlords and all that. Maybe in another town, it's something completely different. Maybe it's not even tiny houses. Um, you know, we just have to, like I said, keep our keep our options open when it comes to how do we do this and engaging the community in a way that makes the most sense for where, wherever we end up. I think because you guys have been so diligent in formulating that why and what you're doing, because you've done that to such a, a great extent, I think that enables your flexibility and it enables you to be able to pivot because you, your your end state, your goal is the same. So whether that's achieved by supplementing vouchers or whether that's achieved by building tiny homes or whether it's some other creative solution that you have yet to discover, it all goes back to your why, the mindset and, and that, that foundation that you guys have built, which I, I absolutely love that. And it really enables you to be uh, very versatile. And I think that's, that's just an incredible testament to what you guys have built, um, you know, just the, the amount of effort that you've put into that. Yeah, it's like I, said, it's I also think that I also think I just love the idea and the fact that that you are just bringing other people like the community and other people that would never be involved in VCP um, to to help out. And it's just I mean, it's just like one huge community problem solving um, type of organization. And I mean, it's, it's awesome, man. I think it's really we've cool. had a lot of. Um, a lot of great success with um, our veterans. We've had a lot of great success with the community. Uh, you know, we've been on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Um, CNN did a story with one of our vets with me and, and a veteran from a housing standpoint um, where she went from homelessness. By the way, she served in the Coast Guard in 1978 for two years. That was, that was the extent of her service. Um, but she was in a bad marriage. After the kids were grown up, she got divorced, ended up basically homelessness between hotels and mostly living in her car. She moved into our village, uh, was there for about 18 months. And again, all of this sounds easy on paper, right? But in reality, it was hard. But after about 18 months, uh, she now is uh, in Kansas City as a Habitat homeowner. So she went from homelessness to home ownership, right? Uh, in about 18 months. Um, and so there's a, a CNN story about that. Uh, if anybody's a Queer Eye fan, uh, one of our founders was on Queer Eye. So we've had some really neat sort of national uh, things that have uh, helped bring people's uh, you know attention to us. If, if anybody watches Tiny uh, Tiny House Nation, um, Zach Giffen is one of the the hosts of that. It's the I think the longest running Tiny House show on TV. I think it's on Netflix now, and um, he will wear that that same shirt that Stu has. Uh, and I get it. I need a shirt, dude. Yeah. Like I get so, it, extra, extra large. That's fine, veteranscommunityproject.org. Uh, and so, uh, but anyway, the point is that we've had a lot of that going on along with our constant engagement with people. It is really just the kindness of the community that has allowed us to do what we're doing. So for me, this is the sort of thing that, yes, I've been babbling this whole time. I gotta tell you, I love it because this is how we get the word out about what we're doing. It's not about me. I don't, I don't care. Like I'm going to be gone for a year. It's not about me at all. It's about making sure that those 40,000 people have a place to sleep tonight and that we never have to deal with this going forward. And could a tiny, you know, a community of tiny houses all over the country that look nice, that are engaging other people, uh, that are, are providing services and all that, could that end that issue? I think the answer is yes. Like I said, it's not, it's inexcusable. It's just not insurmountable. And I think if you have that attitude, you know, we're going to go attack it. Is this it? Is this how we solve veteran homelessness? I don't know. I'll tell you what, we're using it as a solution for that. Maybe we find out two years from now, something completely different. We'll just be flexible and ready to, ready to go execute. And that's what we've done in the military. And that's how we're just going to keep doing it. Right. 
particularly in the Navy. The other branches, I'm not sure about, but Navy for sure. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. It's just the Navy's pretty sweet. Yeah. What? Um, so I, I know we're kind of getting close to the time block, but I, I want to ask this because um, it just kind of um, is resonating with me. Like, what what do you think? What do you think the underlying issue is for veteran homelessness? And and I know that's a pretty broad, you know, reaching question, but if you were to kind of like try to identify one thing that it causes veteran homelessness to even begin with, like, what do you think that'd be? So I'm going to tell you, uh, it depends. That's the answer, right? Okay. Uh, no, that's fair. And, and it's true for general homelessness or veteran homelessness. Um, I don't, you know, cause some of our vet, we have women vets, we have men veterans, uh, we have peacetime, wartime. There's, there's, there is a common, this is where I think some of our success comes in terms of how we're able to help veterans because we all speak a common language, right? Whether we're in the army or the coast guard or whatever it is, we all went to some sort of boot camp, whatever that looked like, right? Um, unless you went to the academy and played football, that doesn't count. Shy of that though, every one of the rest of us went to right? some kind of boot camp, right? So, um, so it, it just, we have a common language. We speak common things. There's some military experience that, that sort of binds us all together. And what we found in our village, for example, is that, uh, this is just a good example, I think, of, um, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're still, you're living next door to me and, and I've got a, a drinking problem and you don't have a drinking problem, you can have alcohol. It's okay. We're going to treat you like an adult because, well, you are one, right? Uh, so you're not a kindergartner, you're an adult. Now, here's what I'll tell you is what we found is not only are our case managers making sure that I'm not drinking because I have a problem, uh, you are going to make sure that I'm not drinking because you, one, want to keep your house. You're certainly going to share, right? And on top of that, you're going to make sure that I'm your battle buddy. I'm your shipmate. You're going to make sure that you make sure where, hey, aren't you supposed to be at your counseling session right now? Why aren't you up? Why aren't you going? So there is that sort of accountability. It's the barracks without the barracks, right? Um, and so everybody's looking out for their battle buddy or shipmate and making sure that those things happen. So we've got the accountability from case managers. We've got accountabilities from, you know, the neighbor. Uh, and it's all housing with dignity. It's granite counters and wood floors and tile backsplash and your own private place, um, so where does it start? It's, it, it's sometimes money. Some guys and gals just have money issues. Some have trauma from their service, um, whether it's a sexual assault, whether it's a military, you know, a, a combat related issue, whatever it happens to be. Right. Um, so I, I can't say that there is one specific thing that is uh, the cause of homelessness in general. It's very complicated. I can say that at least with our particular population, um, there is a common theme that binds all of us. And, you know, when, when a vet says, oh, you don't understand, I was in, a lot of our vets are Vietnam era, you know, you don't understand, uh, you know, I, I was in Vietnam, great, I, I was in Baghdad, tell me how I don't understand, you know, being in war, right, or being shot at by bad guys, whatever it is, and then they're kind of like, oh, all right, well, so let's hold you accountable to what you want to do, Here, here's where we're at, how do we fix the issue, right? Um, and so, like I said, there's no one issue, and I think that's, again, that flexibility out to your, to your question, Stu, is that, um, it's not one size fits all. And some of these programs, because of those federal dollars, and I understand why, they are one size fits all. Here's the square peg, you're around coal, it doesn't matter, you're just gonna have to deal with it, right? We don't have that. It is, let's be flexible. Your, your issues are just plain money. You forgot to pay, a, or you didn't pay a $1,000 uh, rent bill five years ago. And every time you go to rent, they tell you no, because you've got this outstanding debt. Well, once you come stay in one of our houses, this is all based on a true story, stay in one of our houses, we're going to make sure you're employed and we have a budget plan for you. You're going to save $1,000. The minute you save $1,000, we're going to put you in the car and drive you over to that place, pay off that old debt. Great. Now you can rent a place, but we're not going to kick you out now. Now we're going to put you back in the house. And we're going to help you save. Now you're going to have a nest egg and we're going to make sure that you know how to budget and, and all that kind of stuff. And then when you leave us, by the way, and Instead of dropping you like a bad habit, our case manager is going to follow up with you and make sure you're still on your budget. What does your bank account look like? Now, that's voluntary at that point, yet the reality is that there's some accountability that helps you stay on track. The idea is to, you know, make sure that you never get back into that situation again. So we've seen uh, great numbers. Our first, it's small uh, sample size, but we're at 73% uh, transition to permanent housing. Uh, most organizations similar to us are around the 40% not because they're doing something wrong. It is just where they are at. Uh, we're just seeing great numbers, small sample size so far, but uh, we hope that continues. And again, it's I think just treating people like adults, treating them as individuals and using the community to help us um, 
fill the gaps and provide the right level of service for every individual. It's just going to be very different. And I think the more we can customize the support we're giving to people, I think the better off we all are. So it's basically just being nice to people in the way that they need it uh, and making sure that things work for them. So even if they went to the academy and played football. Especially if they went to the academy uh, I mean, and yeah, football. especially those people. Especially, yeah. They need the most help. They need the most help. <laughs> that, <may be> true. <laughs> that is a true yes. statement. True statement. Um, dude, that's awesome, man. Um, so I, I was uh, I was fortunate to be part of, of the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, it was awesome. Uh, you know, he had some really great speakers there, and I'm really excited about where this is going to go. Uh, I'm excited to hear that, you know, there's a lot of other cities and communities that are wanting to do the same thing. Um, how can people you know, get involved, um, you know, and, and, and kind of support, support you guys. So uh, briefly, and I know we're almost out of time, so I will actually make this one brief, uh, is um, basically veteranscommunityproject.org. You can go out there and send us a message. Uh, we're a small staff of people, and so we do answer all the emails, and we have a huge uh, Facebook presence as well. So if you want, you can just find us, Veterans Community Project on Facebook. Uh, reach out. I will tell people, and just to be brutally honest, we've had over 3,000 other cities reach out to us and ask us to come to their town. We've had over 700 who put actual proposals in front of us and said, please, wow. please, please come. That's awesome. I'm not saying that because, hey, look at us, we're awesome. I'm saying that because we get a lot of requests. So I, I just got three today, actually, from uh, realtor friends of mine that are like, hey, we need this in our town. We don't want to say no to anyone. If we had $100 million right now, Hundred million dollars. Hundred million. Uh, that's the goal. All right, we, we have we have a, a giving campaign started for Storehouse Three Ten. So hundred million. That's it, guys. So uh, easy. We should um, be able to do that in like an hour and a half. Um, yeah. So uh, we get all the academy grads, just the ones who played football. We we'll probably get there, right? So um, uh, you might get too much money. You might get too much money. We might want to put some baseball can, players in there. Probably, uh, put some baseball play players play. in there. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, so you know, if we had unlimited amounts of money and unlimited amounts of people, we can go solve all these problems and build these houses all over. Obviously, that's not the issue. So we do need dollars from people. That's the biggest need right now. Um, but it is really just people being involved. And so it, it just, again, being creative real quick is, uh, one, it's dollars. Absolutely, that's the thing. If you are not in a place you can give and you're in one of our cities that we're doing stuff in the spring, we'll have volunteer opportunities in uh, Longmont. Uh, in Kansas City, we have ongoing opportunities if you live there. And as we expand, we'll have more uh, actual time opportunities for people. We even have things where it's like, you know what? I don't know how to write a resume. I don't have time. I do want to do something. We actually, on, your face, on our Facebook page, you'll see when we uh, get one vet moves out of a house and another veteran moves in, um, we give them everything that's in the house. So they get knives and forks and plates and all that. So when they go to their apartment, they have stuff, the bed. And so we restock it. And so you can literally go online and just click on an Amazon list and, um, hey, I want to order the pillows. And you just click pillows, order, send, and then they come to us. You don't even have to leave your chair, right? Uh, so that that's the kind of thing where... Uh, we just have every opportunity you can imagine. Dollars are key. That's always the best way to do it. Uh, there's also just any way that people want to be involved is, is sort of how they can do it. So the easiest way to do it is just go out to the website or go to Facebook and kind of keep track of what we're doing. If we're not in your city, talk to your elected officials, talk to developers, find out, hey, what's the opportunity? Uh, and then we have a director of national expansion who we can absolutely get people in touch with if, if there's real opportunities in different cities. It really does come to dollars, right? I, we have no uh, end in sight for people who want to, you know, swing a hammer and do stuff. Um, if they want to swing a hammer and donate, you know, a couple million dollars, sold, right? Um, and that's just the reality of, of where we are. And, and, and again, talking to this group of folks that understands that, just, hey, break it down for me. What is it? It's dollars one, and then people second when it comes to what we're trying to do. We need both, absolutely, but we can't go anywhere or do anything without the dollars. So veteranscommunityproject.org, click donate or you click volunteer. Even if we're not in your city, it's okay. You can click volunteer uh, and then you'll get emails about what's going on. Facebook's another opportunity. Just like I said, you'll keep track of what's what's happening, where we're at, what we're doing. And um, hopefully at, at some point then when we are nearby, you'll get an email that says, hey, come join us or, or whatever. So anyway, I appreciate you guys letting me be here and take up all of this time and getting the word out. And uh, again, if people have questions, just reach out to us at Veterans Community Project and we'll happy to happy to answer questions and, and whatever we can do to, to help. And even if you know a vet somewhere that's, that needs help, um, again, just reach out. And if we're not in that area, we'll do our best to try and find somebody. Um, obviously in Kansas City and in Colorado are our best opportunities for that right now. But as we expand, we're gonna be looking for talent as well. So 
Hey, Mark, you're, you're a busy man. You're uh, preparing for a year long deployment. You're running a, an amazing uh, nonprofit and uh, you also have a very successful real estate business. So you, you honor us. Uh, we're humbled to have you on. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for blessing us with uh, this message. And, and it's a message of hope. It's a message of, of really of action and mindset and why and goals and, and, and compassion. And I'll tell you what, uh, I'm fired up to uh, grow the partnership with you guys and to support you guys and what you do and, and, and really looking forward to, uh, um, you know, just, just uh, spending more time with you and, and picking your brain on all those things. Cause you are, you and your team are amazing individuals. So thank you. I just want to encourage you that, that you're, you're changing the world and, and this is how stuff gets done, right? This is how people get helped. This is how we serve our tribe. And uh, so, so you honor us with your time. So thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Two last quick things is one, you didn't mention how awesome my hair is. So thanks for nothing. Uh, okay. two, yeah, I actually cut it myself because I'm. I did too. I did mine. <laughs> nice. Well done. <laughs> uh, uh, that may be next if I do this incorrectly. Uh, second thing is I do want people to understand, and I coach agents all the time on this stuff, is that um, if you're not in a position right now where you want to be like, oh, I want to be able to give and I'm just not there yet. That's okay. Go, go win. Go win at what you're doing first there'll be lots of opportunities to, to pay it forward later, right? Stay focused, stay really focused on that why and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, if it's for your family, that's okay. Make that stuff work first, then there'll be opportunities to provide support to people like Veterans Community Project and, and, and others. So uh, stay focused on where you're at, stay focused on what you're doing, um, and then there's lots of opportunities to get involved once you get to the point where you're, where you're good and you're solid. So, so get yourself on, on good footing and then pay it forward. Great advice, man. Love it. Um, well, we have a, a campaign started through Storehouse Streets and Ventures. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Uh, so, you know, go there, click on the link, donate. Um, uh, they need a million dollars a year uh, per site. Uh, you know, they're getting the Colorado one going. Our, our campaign is for the Colorado location. Um, I'm going to go swing some hammers the next spring. Watch out. There Dude, some, they're going to need uh, like a million and like uh, – 300 because all the nails that you're going to bend crooked and someone's gonna have to come behind you and pull them out. Like it's a force. It's a mass times acceleration thing. That's what, uh, you know, force. We have that budgeted in by the way. So good. Yeah. That's you, good. I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure you guys had the, all right. you know, um, but Hey, share this, tell people about this podcast, tell people about veterans community project. And uh, most importantly, go fill your storehouse. Make it a great day. See you. Sure. Thanks.